Welcome to this rapid revision video looking at the liberal reforms between 1906 and 1914. Some historians view this as the start of the modern welfare state in Britain, whereas others might say that that comes later. What we can be sure of, though, is this is a marked contrast to how 19th century governments behaved. So what did it involve? Firstly, we need to remind ourselves what 19th century government was like. In the 19th century, most governments were conservative or Tory. The Tories believed that things should be left as they are and that the government shouldn't get involved in every, people's everyday lives. Now, be aware that I'm talking about 19th century Tories here and not modern ones. This approach was known as laissez-faire or do-nothing government. This meant that they were often very slow to make changes, believing that the government wasn't responsible for making improvements and that people should do this for themselves. As a consequence, many of the reforms that happened during the 19th century were very gradual and very cautious. Some people saw this as sensible, others saw it as a frustration of issues that needed to be dealt with quickly. So what was the Liberal government and how was it different? In 1906, the Liberal Party won the 1906 election by a landslide. Their huge majority meant that they could be more adventurous with the laws that they introduced, as it would be easier to pass them. They promised to change how ordinary and poor people were cared for because they were not afraid of changing things. They felt that the government should intervene in people's lives, including by raising taxes and forcing people to adopt these changes even if they didn't like them. The architect of this change was David Lloyd George. David Lloyd George was a famous Welsh liberal politician. He became prime minister in World War I, but before this he made his name as Chancellor of the Ex Exchequer and as a great reformer. The Chancellor was in charge of how the government spent its money, what they called the budget. Lloyd George wanted the government to raise more money in tax and spend more on helping people. Lloyd George was from a reasonably humble background in Gwynedd, North Wales. He was po a powerful and persuasive speaker who liked to get his way. He proposed a people's budget, which would provide old age pensions, meals and health care for poor children and some sick pay for workers. All of these were really quite new ideas. However, all of this would cost money and that had to be raised by, how, by higher taxes. Some of that would come from the rich, but some of that meant higher taxes for poorer people too. So not everyone liked his ideas. This source provides a reaction to David Lloyd George's People's Budget, and it's not a favourable one. The source is titled The Philanthropic Highwayman. It's subtitled I'll Make Them Pity the Aged Poor. Make them, mark you. The cartoon was published in Punch magazine in 1908, which was a popular magazine which commented on the affairs of the day. Philanthropists used their money to help other people, whereas highwaymen traditionally robbed rich people using the nation's roads. One way that you can pull apart this source is by doing this. What can you infer from this source about reactions to Lloyd George's pensions plans? All right, this isn't the sort of question that you'll actually be asked in the exam about this type of source. It's the sort of question that you might find, for example, in paper three. But the skills might well be useful to you and actually as an exercise for understanding the source and opposition to David Lloyd George's plans, it could be useful. So if you want to do that, you can pause the video here. If not, I'll tell you what my inferences are shortly. So what can you infer from this source again about reactions to David Lloyd George's pension plans? Well, I can infer that some people were against the people's budget. Detail on the source that tells me this is that Lloyd George is being presented as a thief. I can infer that some people supported the budget. And the detail on the source that tells me this is that Lloyd George is being described as a philanthropist who helps others. So ultimately, what the message of this source is that David Lloyd George will help old age pensioners by collecting taxes, whether people like it or not. And if you look closely at the source, at the back of the road underneath that tree, we can see the rich arriving in their cars. Supposedly, David Lloyd George is about to pull down his mask, point his gun at them and say, your money or your life. So what were the liberal reforms and what did it introduce? We're going to look at a series of changes, who it helped and how it helped them. One of the earliest changes between 1902 and 1907, so slightly predating the 1906 election, were reforms to midwifery. Babies were now delivered by qualified midwives. All births had to be registered so that the mother could get help if needed and that the baby could not just disappear. So this helped mothers and babies. How? Because childbirth was still reasonably dangerous. This reform ensured that midwives knew the best and safest methods known. 
It also protected babies by getting them legally registered at birth so that support could be provided and they couldn't just be abandoned or mistreated. Then in 1906, all children were given a free meal at school if they needed it. This helped children and families. Social studies had shown how hard it was for poor families to feed their children. This reform ensured that all children had at least one good meal a day, which was really crucial for them. Uh, one of the reports that found this was by Joseph Roundtree, the chocolatier who came from York. He studied uh, the population of York, including some of his own workers, and was shocked to find how difficult it was for children to get healthy meals. Between 1907 and 1912, nurses performed three health checks in schools. Later, permanent clinics were set up and these nurses carried on their duties. This also helped children and families. Few poor families could afford doctor's fees. These checks allowed children to get early help and it helped identify emerging illnesses before they became too serious. In 1908, and this is a really big one now, old age pensions were introduced. The elderly, which under the law meant anyone over the age of 70, which really was quite elderly at the time, were given an old age pension. This was roughly equivalent to £50 a week in today's money. Doesn't sound like a lot, but the idea was that someone wasn't meant to live off that. It was meant to top up their earnings and keep them out of the workhouse. So this helped people aged 70 plus, And although small, the pension was often enough to keep the poor elderly people from having to resort to the workhouse because they'd be able to use it to supplement their own income or savings. And lastly, 1909. Building on the earlier Housing Acts, new building standards were enforced. Back to back terrace housing was banned. Uh, but that didn't mean that the stuff that was already standing was immediately demolished. However, this did help some poor tenants. Back-to-back -back terrace houses were cold, cramped and damp. Banning them made people more comfortable and helped prevent the spread of disease. So far, so good. But I've not even mentioned the biggest change of all just yet. The biggest change was the 1911 National Insurance Act. You might be familiar with the term national insurance. It's still around today. This is really important. In some ways, it's still around. It didn't help everyone, but it was a start. And I'm going to create a diagram, which you might want to note down for yourself, which demonstrates how the 1911 National Insurance Act worked. It all focused on a sickness fund. This was an imaginary pot of money that could be spent to support workers who fell ill. It was topped up by workers who paid four pence a week. This was a reasonable amount of money for a poor family, but many saw this as worthwhile, but not all. Their employers would also pay threepence a week, or three pennies a week. The government would also pay two pence a week per worker. So for every worker who was contributing to the scheme, the, the, scheme, the worker paid four pence, their employer paid threepence, and the government paid tuppence. That means a total of nine pence per worker per week was paid into the sickness fund. Even by the standards of the day, that's not a huge amount of money. However, it wasn't needed by everyone. If you needed to claim sick pay, and if you had been paying into the sickness fund, if you became sick and were unable to work, you got a sick pay of 10 shillings a week for up to 26 weeks. This could be spent on bills and medical fees. Again, this wasn't a lot of money, but it might be the difference between a family becoming destitute because the main breadwinner wasn't able to work and being able to just about manage. And that was the process here. You paid a small amount into a sickness fund just in case you needed it. That might explain why it's called national insurance. You're hoping you'll never need it, but you'll be glad that it's there if you ever do. A bit like you hope that you'll never need to claim on your car insurance. But if you ever do, you'll be glad that you've got it and not just because it's the law. So that's the National Insurance Act. Seems to make sense, doesn't it? Well, where does Lloyd George get this idea? One argument is from the Great Western Railway, who at their Swindon branch actually built workers' housing and had a sick fund of their own, which was managed by the workers. And it proved that workers were in fact willing to pay a small amount for their wages uh, to pay for care in the event that they did become injured or ill. And then this was just applied on a national scale. Who were the winners and losers then of the National Insurance Act? Advantages of a National Insurance Act included all people who could take sick leave to recover from illness with some pay. But non-working women and children were excluded from the scheme. An advantage was that the government and employers also contributed to the sickness fund, so there was enough money. However, health care itself still wasn't free. People were expected to pay for that out of their sick fund. The sick pay could pay for health care and to feed workers' families in de desperate times. 
but the sick pay only lasted 26 weeks, so long-term illnesses were not covered after this point. Another disadvantage was that the unemployed and elderly were not covered because, almost by definition, they could not pay into the work sick fund. So don't think that this is like the NHS. It's maybe the very start of the idea that we all pay a little bit in or, um, so that we can get health care if we need it, but it's not the same thing. So how much support was there for national insurance? As we've seen, national insurance helped a large number of poorer people. However, it was also tremendously expensive and ordinary people and rich people alike had to contribute to it, which could be unpopular. It also marked another move away from the principles of laissez-faire government, and some, mostly wealthier people, didn't like the government meddling with the lives of individuals. So how, how much support was there for national insurance? We're going to imagine that you've got to focus on this inquiry. Although you won't be asked this style of question on this particular topic, it is a sort of question that you'll have to answer in paper three and also in the paper one source investigation. So again, good skills on, on the show here. But most of all, though, it's going to give you an idea as to what the reactions were to Lloyd George's plans. So Source A is an information poster produced by the Liberal Party in 1911 when their plans were made public. It says the dawn of hope, national insurance against sickness and disablement, and shows a sick man, presumably a worker, with David Lloyd George with his national insurance bill in his pocket. Mr Lloyd George's national insurance bill provides the insurance of the worker in case of, si of sickness. Support the Liberal government in their policy of social reform. So what are the uses in terms of our inquiry? which is looking at support for Lloyd George's liberal reforms. Well, there are several uses. The source suggests that the reforms helped people and that this was popular with workers. It suggests, though, that not everyone supported the reforms as the liberals felt the need to convince people with a campaign. The limitations, though, show that the source was produced by the Liberal Party, so it will give a biased view in favour of the reforms. It tells us nothing about the reasons why people opposed the plans or how many did. Maybe the next source will be of more help in that respect. Let's have a look. Source B is a cartoon again from the magazine Punch. This is from June 1912 as the National Insurance Act came into force. So it's been passed, it's got it through Parliament, now it's the law. The source suggests that there was fierce opposition to the plans. That's what the arrows are all about. It also suggests that Lloyd George was able to introduce his budget in spite of all this opposition, as he is pictured still standing despite the arrows in him. And he even says at the bottom, now gentlemen, after these refreshing preliminaries, let us get to business. Limitations, though. The source is likely to be in favour of Lloyd George as they placed a halo over his hat, suggesting that the cartoonist at least agrees with him. The source contains few specific details about who supported plans and who didn't. The fact of the matter was, it was very much a political view. Most traditional conservatives were very much against this. They felt that people should be able to pay into their own private insurance or pay for their own doctors should they need them, not have to pay into a fund which they might never use. Other, other people, especially Liberal voters and a few Labour supporters too, though they were quite a new thing at this point, felt that this was a vital lifeline for the poor. So to sum up with some final points. Many 19th century governments believed in doing little to intervene in people's lives. This was known as laissez-faire, do nothing or leave alone government. When the Liberal Party were elected in 1906, they promised to govern differently with a radical programme of taxes and public spending. Chancellor of the Exchequer David Lloyd George launched his People's Budget, which included free health care and meals in schools, old age pensions and more. One of the biggest changes was the 1911 National Insurance Act, which provided sick pay for all workers who contributed. Some people supported these reforms as providing a vital safety net for the poor. Others opposed the changes as expensive and an overreach of government power. However, some changes still exist today, and they may well be seen as the first moves towards a government-funded welfare state. That's the end of this rapid revision video. I hope it's been useful to you, and if it has, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. But for now, I'll say thanks very much for watching, and good health.